society is raised to be Christian. In Deuteronomy, we hear this commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all your soul and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home. That's a command that we're to do, right? Talk to our kids. Talk to our grandkids. We're supposed to talk to our neighbors with God's help. We will with God's help. Will you, by your prayers and witness, help her to grow into the full stature of Christ, into Christian maturity? If so, say, we will with God's help. We will with God's help. In light of presenting Ivy, it's appropriate to reaffirm your own baptismal vows as parents. So do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you away from the love of God? If so, say, we do. We do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Savior and sanctifier? If so, say, we do. We do. Do you put your whole trust in his grace and love and promise to follow him all of your life? If so, say, we do. We do. Congregation, will you who witness these vows do all in your power to support Ivy in her life in Christ. If so, say, we will with God's help. Thank you. you with the sign of Christ. In the name of the Father, <laughs> and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Almighty God, we absolutely adore you. In the way that you have created us, in the way that we get to see that, in the life of a little one like Ivy. Father, in the way that we get to see Jason and Amy raise up their children to know you, and to love you, we're reminded that you are our Father. In the way that they have guided and shepherded their children, the children of our church, our congregation, we ask, Father, that you will honor yourself as once again they commit themselves to raise Ivy to know you, and that your grace will go before her, guide her, reveal yourself to her. Father, we pray that she will come to know you and follow you and make the decisions that honor you and demonstrate a loving relationship with you all of the days of her life. Almighty God, we offer this family to you as they offer Ivy Claire to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now usually I would hold her and walk around, but Amy, I'm going to let you do that. <laughs> Friends, this is... Ivy Claire, she uh, is just one of the most fun kiddos to watch chase her brothers and sister around. And uh, we would have done this a bit ago, but uh, COVID prevented that, and so now we get to do it today. And uh, those are a bunch of people she knows. Her grandmas and grandpas are here, and aunts and uncles. Thank you all for being here today. Let's uh, celebrate Ivy's baptism today. Pastor Jen, would you please come and read our scripture lessons for us today?
Good morning. Our Old Testament lesson today is from 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 15. Um, 2 Samuel can be found after 1 Samuel and before 1 Kings. Here we find the story of Uriah and his wife Bathsheba, of King David's acts of adultery and murder. When Bathsheba is described as Uriah's wife in the genealogy, in the genealogy of Jesus, we once again see Jesus choosing to take up residence in our brokenness. The Old Testament lesson is 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 15. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period. Then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. Then David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent him to David. When Uriah arrived, David asked him how Joab and the army were getting along and how the war was progressing. Then he told Uriah, go on home and relax. David even sent a gift to Uriah after he had left the palace, but Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. When David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he summoned him and asked, What's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? Uriah replied, The ark and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents, and Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I would never do such a thing. Well, stay here today, David told him, and tomorrow you may return to the army. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. Then David invited him to dinner and got him drunk. But even then, he couldn't get Uriah to go home to his wife. Again, he slept at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. So the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. The letter instructed Joab, station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fiercest, then pull back so that he will be killed. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> All right. The, the New Testament lesson is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Ephesians can be found after Galatians and before Philippians. At the conclusion of the story of Eden, we find Adam and Eve banished from it and their relationship with God broken, a physical brokenness and also a spiritual brokenness. In Ephesians, we find healing begun. Paul's name, Paul names spiritual blessings, asks for spiritual wisdom, and in today's text, prays for the fullness of spiritual reality. The New Testament lesson is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. Uh, verses 14 through 21. When I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ. Though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus, through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Be 
friends this morning, I'd like for you to take our friendship registry. Please pass it down. We love to know who worships with us from week to week. It is so fun seeing some of you. I haven't seen some in person for a while, so welcome back. If uh, you haven't been here in a bit because of the pandemic, we have our guests here with us as well. Uh, today, uh, we have just spent a week at District Assembly. I mentioned that's where like there's 90 churches in the Kansas City area gathering together and doing the business of the Church of the Nazarene. And one of the things that we get to do at that time is to ordain new ministers and recognize new district license ministers. And we have a youth service and get to hear stories from young people. One of the things that we value as a district, and it reminded how we value it here at Christ Community, is the development of leaders. This summer, we've hired Pastor Josh to be our full-time youth pastor, and that has been great. And we have asked him to stay on for the school year part-time. He's going to go back and get his master's and run track, but he's going to continue working part-time among us. And so he is also moving his membership here. If any of you are grateful for his influence or that he's becoming a member or if you just like the name Josh or Jesus, then will you please welcome Pastor Josh. It has been a good summer. Thanks for all of your good work. We also value developing and helping those who have experienced a call to ministry figure out what that is. And so there are several among us that are just taking that journey, one of whom is Forrest Fisk. Forrest usually runs the, the camera. He works a lot with our Facebook and discipling our children, now participating in Alpha. And you've been around uh, seven years, and we love you. We are so grateful for you. One of the reasons that you came to Christ Community is you knew our commitment to help people to develop and experience that call. And part of that for you is preaching. So today, Forrest is going to be our preacher. And he's asked that I would read the gospel lesson for us today. And so will you please stand with me? I'm going to read from the gospel of John. Beginning at chapter 6. After this, Jesus crossed over the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. And turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all of these people? He was testing Philip for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. And then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. And then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, distributed to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish. And they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. And so they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left over by the people who had eaten the five barley loaves. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, Surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. And that evening, Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait for him. But as darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, they got into the boat and headed across the lake toward Capernaum. And soon a gale swept down upon them and the sea grew very rough. They'd rowed three or four miles when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. And they were terrified, but he called out to them. Don't be afraid, I am here. Then they were eager 
to let him in the boat, and immediately they arrived at their destination. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Thank you. You may be seated. The little boy with the bread and the fish. That's an illustration of how no matter your size or your position, that you are enough for whatever God wants to do. And God will do it through you, if you're willing. Where are you feeling like you're not quite enough? Are you not enough in your marriage? Are you not enough at your job? Are you, are you not enough according to other people's expectations? Or more importantly, your own? What is it that you feel too small for or that you're not enough for? You are enough for whatever God wants to do, and God will do it through you if you're willing. That's the message that John is telling us in this story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. That's slightly different perspective than you can do anything with God's help. And I like that second thought. If God wants to help you, great. Anything is possible with God. Um, but that's not the exact perspective in this particular story. This story teaches us that you are enough for whatever God wants to do. The difference is subtle, but important. It's important that you also see yourself in this story. And in this story, you are the crowd, and Jesus is God. And as you walk with God, like the crowds walked with Jesus, you realize that God is on a mission, and if you join God's mission, all of your needs will be met along the way. And then some, and then some, and everyone in your circle of influence will be taken care of too. The good news is that God is with you, so do something about it. We will even provide a way for you to take a little bit of Jesus with you today, as partaking in communion can be a first step in this amazing journey with God. And as we go, we can pray to learn what God's mission looks like in our own place in life, and we can leave this place all excited because we know that we are enough for whatever God wants to do through us. Are you excited? All right, all right. I want to dive in here. So I want to take it back to first principles. We're reading this from the Gospel of John. And John, for some reason, he's very adamant that you know that Jesus is God. And I don't know where you sit with this and whether it's a big deal to you or not, but to John, the author of this gospel, it's big concern. And I believe it's something that God wants you to know at some point too. And by the way, this passage, as well as the others that we read today, um, are from the lectionary. If you don't know what that is, it means I didn't choose the passage to preach because it said something I wanted to say specifically. The lectionary is a set of scriptures that is a suggested reading. And churches all over the world are encouraged to teach these set of verses in specific days so that we can be on the same page. It's, it helps form a global perspective and also keeps preachers from cherry-picking their favorite verses each week um, and ignoring the breadth and depth of all the topics the Bible has to offer. That being said, a critical topic for today from this verse is that Jesus is God. So back in the Old Testament, there's this little story, little tiny, of a little pro of a prophet, a holy name, a holy man named Elisha. And all the people gathered around Jesus when he was feeding the 5,000 knew this miracle story. And because this Old Testament story is so short, I'm going to read the whole thing to you. 2 Kings 4 says, A man came from Baal Shalisha, and brought the man of God, Elisha, 20 loaves of barley bread. They had been baked from the first grain that had been ripened. The man also brought some heads of grain. Give this food to the people to eat, Elisha said. Uh, 
how can I put this in front of a hundred men, his servant asked. But Elisha answered, give it to the people to eat. Do it, because the Lord said they will eat and have some left over. Then the servant put the food in front of them, and they ate it and had some left over. It had happened just as the Lord said it would. So in this Old Testament story, we see a multiplication of a five-fold increase. Twenty loaves of bread fed a hundred men. But in our New Testament story today, it's a thousand-fold increase. You got five loaves fed 5,000 men, uh, plus women and children. No wonder the people were amazed. Elisha was said to have, reached a, uh, have received a double portion of God's Spirit more than his very powerful mentor, Elijah. And here Jesus comes along and makes Elisha's miracle look small, pathetic, and puny. And this feeding of 5,000 men is after all the miracles of healing so many people that it gathered a crowd. So we already see that the people are amazed. The gospel goes on to say, when the people saw Jesus do this miracle, miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. I had no idea what that was all about. So I looked it up. <laughs> Um, and this is one of those passages that all the Israelites around Jesus would have known about too, like the story of Elisha we just read about. I don't know, but this prophet they were expecting is mentioned in Deuteronomy 18. In short, there was a time when God was talking to the Israelites as a fiery mountain, and it freaked the people out so much that they all thought they were all going to die. <laughs> so God promised he would send a messenger Someone to speak God's word who is more personable and less frightening. And it was important that we, or the people of Israel, not that we're the people of Israel, but the people and us need to listen to him. And in case you don't know, John is claiming that Jesus is this prophet. But even more than the most powerful prophet Elijah or Elisha, many, many times more powerful. And if that wasn't enough, the next passage we read about, the one about Jesus walking on the water, that one says that he's more than a prophet. It says that Jesus is God. It said the disciples were terrified of seeing someone on the water, but Jesus called out to them, don't be afraid, I am here. That might not sound like a claim we care about, but we have to go back one more Old Testament in one more time in the Old Testament to make the connection why this passage says that Jesus is God. So way back when Moses was a young lad of only about 80 years old, just before he talked to Pharaoh, Moses encountered a burning bush where God talked to him, telling him to talk to Pharaoh and set the Israelite people free. And here in Exodus 3, it says, but Moses protested to God, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has said to me, uh, you know, what is his name? The God of your ancestors has sent me. They ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? Moses asked of God. So God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. Now grammatically, Ah, my computer thinks that's all messed up. But it's the best way that God decided to convey God's message, God's message to Moses. So, whenever you hear a slightly messed up grammar when it comes to I am in the Bible, it's referencing this beacon of a passage in the Bible. So after Jesus walked 5,000 meters on water, and after feeding at least 5,000 people, Jesus basically said, the I am is here. In another language, it's in another language, Greek. It's like it's saying, behold, it is I. And even if you know, even now, if you said something like, behold, it is I, people would look at you funny like, are you William Shakespeare or something? But in Greek, you don't need the extra I. You just say, am here. So all who were listening would have known that I am the I am passage. And he doesn't just say, behold, it is, it is I, or I am here. 
Jesus backed it up with a miracle. And it says, they were eager to let him on the boat, and immediately they arrived at their destination. The e- they immediately and miraculously arrived on shore, and there wasn't a doubt in their minds that he claimed and proved that Jesus is God. So we've talked a length a bit here just to talk about the ways in which John is trying to convince us, us the readers of his book, why Jesus is God. And there are countless other reasons in the book of John alone to convince us that Jesus is God. And I mention it here in my sermon because it's a definite theme bubbling out of the text. So I've got to highlight it. But just like the disciples who were all fed because they were working with Jesus on God's mission, we must not forget that you who have God with you through the Holy Spirit have the same access to God as the disciples did when they were with Jesus. And when you join God's mission, all of your needs will be met. Let me that, read that again to you. Join God's mission, and all of your needs will be met. Now, that's a claim. That's a claim I think the Bible is saying here. It's a little nuanced in how I said it. So don't go trying to jump off a cliff on me because you took it the wrong way. I think in general, God will really meet all of your needs. And specifically, God will when you're participating in God's mission. Just think about it. God is on a mission. The mission is to restore and recreate the world on earth as it is in heaven. God has asked that we join in that mission and that we, the church, are the vehicle through which God wants to accomplish that goal. And won't God supply all the needs and all the helpers? Yes, even as the scriptures claim, if all that's available is one child's lunch offered up to be blessed by God, then God's mission will be done. I think that's amazing. Now, this isn't saying even when you don't join God's mission, God won't meet all your needs. But the perspective, I believe, is being portrayed here in this passage of Scripture is shifted just a little bit left of what we normally think. This story isn't asking you to stick around Jesus and you'll get whatever you need, like some parasite mosquito sucking on Jesus, and when you've had your fill of his blood, you shout, there's power in his blood. And then go home full and leave. No, this, this isn't a story of how we get full, from Je- full of Jesus and then go home satisfied. It's not even a story of how to continually find Jesus and feed off of him, though that is other places in the Bible. This story is an invitation to follow Jesus' actions, not just follow him for, the, for his social power and status. You aren't called to have all of your needs met by Jesus in this story. You are called to join God's mission, and then all of your needs will be met. The reason I say this is because in this story, every time someone tries to follow Jesus just to have their needs met, it's at this point in the story that Jesus runs away from them. Jesus did miracles, then the crowds came, and went to Je- and, and Jesus then went up on a mountain. Jesus saw the crowds, and after they, he fed them, they not only wanted to keep him around, they wanted to encumber him with the glory of being their king so they could keep hanging around him and keep getting free food. Come, all you mosquitoes, you parasites, you ticks. Jesus is here. Let's make him our king. It's at that point that Jesus actively hides in the hills. I mean, look at it. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped in, into the hills by himself. Let me tell you something. You aren't going to catch Jesus if all you want are the things that he can provide you. He's not here for you to get full tummies and a sense of warm fuzzies. He's not here to give you an ego boost because you're better than the rest of us because you found him and they didn't. This story isn't about you and what Jesus will do to pamper you. You need to get up and work. Join God's mission and all of your needs will be met. Simple needs. Basic needs. Give us this day our daily bread sorts of needs. A gluten-free option as fish is also available kind of needs. Strangely enough, this story, I think, is a little 
invitation for a career opportunity with amazing benefits sort of a story. Okay, bear with me. Just think about this. Jesus' followers had already signed up for this new job. They set down their nets and did a 180-degree career move. At this point, they were already his disciples. They were getting on-the-job training, and at least 5,000 people were there for the recruitment meeting. I'm going to back up a second here. In this same gospel in John, uh, all the disciples were taking a break and they went out to get something to eat, and Jesus kept right on working. Jesus encountered an outsider, the Samaritan woman at the well. He told her that he himself was God, saying, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. And it was with that same I am sort of horrible grammar that points to the same beacon in the Bible, where God says, it's me, I am the great I am. Are you sensing a theme here? Yeah, John really wants us to know that Jesus is God but we've already covered that, so I want to keep going. Anyway, she left and did something about this new information she got and started telling, telling everyone she knew about Jesus. And then the disciples came back from their lunch break. Remember, we're still talking about how if we join God's mission, all your needs will be met. Okay, so the disciples came back to Jesus, who had been working this whole time, and he says to them, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and, and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. I tell you this little aside about the woman at the well because it illustrates my point that this is God's mission. And when you join God's mission, all of your needs will be met. And even if by some fluke they aren't met here on earth, maybe an accident occurs or someone with bad intentions ruins your good efforts, our Heavenly Father is keeping tabs, keeping a tally of wages and benefits. Not, if not to be paid out in this life, then at least one will be paid out in the life to come. Come on, join the team, Team Missio, Missio Dei, the mission of God. We've got great benefits and apparently a salary God is keeping track of. The Gospel of Luke, it says, it will be given to you, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured out into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Oh my goodness. I'm excited. Are you, are you excited to join up for God's mission? I am. And when you join God's mission, your needs will be met and then some. But I want to circle back. We need to put ourselves into this story again. We are a ragtag group of 12 disciples following Jesus. And now it's time to get that free staff lunch we were talking about. And with a wink and a nod, Jesus was teasing poor Philip, asking him to pay for enough food to feed everybody. Actually, did you notice the story about Elisha? It mirrors that. So Elisha said, give this food to the people to eat. And just like Elisha's servant freaked out, poor Philip started freaking out at the impossibility of it all. The Bible says Jesus was testing Philip. I think teasing is a better word. That Jesus, that sneaky, teasing, wonderful man Jesus. He, didn't, he did all this without a single concern in the world because he knew how this staff lunch was going to get paid for. It was going to be on his dime because it was his mission all along. This story isn't about you. It's about him and what he is going to do through you. That excites me. Isn't it thrilling to not only witness miracles, but to, get, to have God do miracles through you? Are, are you? You are enough for whatever God wants to do through you. Amen? Are you enough for whatever God wants to do through you? Uh, say it out here, out loud with me. One, three, two, one. I am enough. Now, read it on the screen very carefully now. Again, the I am is enough. He's enough. You are enough for whatever God wants to do through you. So what is it that God wants to do through you? What is it that you're not feeling adequate in? Maybe you grew up with bad parents or no parents at all. And now you have kids, and you're worried that you aren't enough. 
and that you want to do the best for them, you are enough for what God wants to do through you. Maybe you've done something pretty bad in the past, and it's preventing you from move, moving forward. And even in your crud, even in your crud, you are deeply loved by God. And you have enough in you now for God to work with and to bring healing and hope to others. Maybe it seems like you can only do little things and nothing you do is perfect. Remember the little boy's lunch? It's going to be all right. You have enough for God to work through you. Remember Philip? Philip, he had a momentary freakout moment. He apparently didn't get the memo that you are enough for whatever God wanted to do through you, even after he knew the passage about Elisha. <laughs> That's on the job training for you. There's always someone who is just a little bit behind the rest of the group. But that's okay. We love Philip. And Jesus especially loved Philip. And besides, I think Jesus was teasing anyway. And look, Andrew has something to say. Andrew was the quieter brother of Peter. It seems like it's always the quieter ones who notice the important little details, right? Andrew noticed this little kid coming among the crowd. Andrew was one of those kind-hearted men who listened to children. He paid attention to what God values, and God values the opinions and efforts of little kids very much. Without Andrew's attention to detail or compassion on the children and hearing what they had to say, who's to say the miracle would have happened the same way as it's written here in the Bible? Regardless, this miracle of feeding the 5,000 men and five to 10,000 men and uh, women and children, this miracle was accomplished through a child. If you're a child, listen up. What you offer to God matters. Whoever is willing to say yes to God, is co God's calling is going to have enough and be enough for God to work through you. Adults, too, listen up. No matter the titles behind your name, no matter your education, no matter your color, no matter your gender, no matter your abilities or disabilities, no matter who you are, you are enough for what God wants to do through you. You are enough. You have enough. You will be enough. And because of you and your saying yes, they'll all have enough. Your family will have enough. Your school will have enough. Your community will have enough. Look, the disciples picked up 12 complete baskets of leftovers, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, and running over. Do you know why Jesus let there be 12 baskets of bread running over and full to the brim? It's because there were 12 tribes of Israel. He was proving a point that every tribe of Israel is going to get what they need when people are willing to work with God to accomplish God's mission. God's mission there was to restore and recreate life in the people of Israel at that time. But this time, it's through you. God will bless the world. Let me tell you a little story of how our church is, is doing this here and now. Pastor Amy was up here just a little bit ago. And she was doing a craft project with the kids where the kids could cut up and rip up little pieces of paper and create their own little collage and put it in a plastic cup. And here's a picture. Do we have a picture? Of Annabelle with her little cup. The kids were supposed to save up their spare change in this cup and give it to Pastor Amy, who was supposed to donate it to Nazarene Compassionate Ministries and their WASH program. It's a project fully sponsored by all of our tithe money. So 100% of the kids' donations to the program went strictly to building wells, fixing wells and water treatment facilities, and making flush toilets, and teaching hygiene principles to people in third world countries. Anyway, Annabelle, my daughter, she had some change and forgot about it. By the time she remembered to turn it in, it was too late. Pastor Amy had already collected everyone else's money and sent it in. Have you ever been late and felt like you weren't good enough? Well, Annabelle had a birthday, and then Christmas, 
and she'd been saving up her money for several birthdays and several Christmases. She actually had a lot of money for a little kid, and during the same time, Daddy, behold, the great, not, not the great I am, I had just been figuring out how in the world to add money to the stock market for the first time. So I encouraged her to save her money there for college or a car or something in the future and to let it grow there. But God was still working in her heart. She never forgot those poor people who didn't have clean drinking water. And she wanted to give all of her money to them. She was content. She had all she needed. Isn't that awesome? Well, I cautioned her against giving it all away, saying that money doesn't tend to grow from nothing. So I told her I would let her give half of her money, and I would ask my friends on Facebook and seek their contributions. And maybe we would together be able to donate just about $1,000 to the project. And by Christmas just last year, Annabelle took out half of her money and what she had gained in the stock market. Then my friends added enough to push that just over $1,000. And there was enough to help dig a well or buy a flush toilet so that a village wouldn't die from contaminated water. And I think that's amazing. (laughs) And uh, just a funny aside, today we have professional cameras and computers and equipment and slideshow and it was Facebook was just giving us all trouble nothing was working and I really wanted to share this with my friends but guess what I had a cell phone in my pocket and that was enough (laughs) so whoever's online is listening on my cell phone in the back and apparently what I had on me it was enough (laughs) so it's really important that you don't miss this last little point And it's really easy to gloss over this, but if you don't know, God is with you. Now, and you have access to Jesus at any time. I'll briefly go over the basics. When Jesus died and came back to life, he had one more important thing to do. He came back to communicate the important information that he was going to to upload a software patch in our minds which allows us to communicate with and have Jesus the King in our own hearts and minds. Okay, so it's not a software patch. Jesus was just plain and simple going to give us Jesus' very own spirits, the Holy Spirit of Jesus. And because Jesus is God, this spirit is God's spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. That's a lesson we might need to talk about in more length in a different day, but with the Holy Spirit in you, God is with you. Look how important it is to the disciples that Jesus is with them in this story. When Jesus was with them, they finally got some traction in their life. After feeding the 5,000, we read that... We, after reading the, the feeding of the 5,000, we read of Jesus walking on the water. Remember that story? The story is recorded two other times in the New Testament. The Gospel of Matthew and Mark. And in both of those times, Jesus asked the disciples to get on the boat and go on without him. Well, that's nice. They were good and honest, obedient disciples. But here in John, the 12 dude friends of Jesus were like, well, Jesus is still hiding in the hills trying not to be crowned king so we can get some free food. I guess he's not coming back. Let's go on without him. And that's basically what it reads. I mean, look at it, what it says. It says, in that evening, Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait for him, But as darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, they got in the boats and headed across the lake toward Capernaum without him. Disciples, what are you doing? That is, that's a terrible game. Hide and go, disciple. You at least need to tell Jesus that you're not playing the game anymore. That's not how to be a good disciple. You need Jesus with you. I mean, I think that's funny. But... Rarely is scripture written in a way that's funny for fun's sake, though I really like that idea. John, the gospel writer, is trying to convey a message by writing it differently than Matthew and Mark do in their gospels. So what is the message that John is trying to convey? The message is that the disciples were trying and trying and trying to get somewhere, Capernaum, but it didn't make a bit of difference. It was only when Jesus got on the boat that it made any difference at all. 
And then when he was with them, their task was miraculously and immediately completed. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> when God is with you and you're on God's mission, anything is possible. Do the thing. Do something about it. With the power of the Holy Spirit, God is with you. So do something about it. I'm excited. Are you excited? And if you don't know where to start, then you're in some for an awesome and amazing treat. Today we have a bit of Jesus right here for you to take with you and inside of you. Here in just a little bit, we have an opportunity to receive communion. I call it communion instead of the Eucharist because we commune with God. But if you don't have or have never had communion with God, this communion can be a first step in joining God's story. Somebody once told me that you can think of communion like accepted, accepting Jesus, not just mentally, but physically, like a sign and a signal to your own brain that you are allowing God to come inside of you, or at least be with you like Jesus was in the boat with his disciples. And after I heard that thought, it's always been a devious little thought of mine to pour the communion water in the city municipal water system. Now everyone can have a bit of Jesus. <laughs> but it's, it's not an elixir. It's, it's not magic. It's just a bit of bread and some grape juice representing Jesus' body and blood, which he gave to us unto death to prove how much God loves you. Would you like to accept a small part of Jesus to go with you today? Communion can be a first step in signing up for this team, Missio Dei, the mission of God, where we get to help God recreate the world like it is in heaven. Communion can be a first step in getting traction in your life, finally getting someplace that you've been wanting to go with Jesus. Communion can be a first step in asking God to be with you. And once God is with you, you can finally start doing something about living this amazing adventure with God. So, it's time for communion. Pastor Scott, would you come up here and lead us for communion? Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for Jesus, who is God, and that he has given us your spirit to live in us, that we would be able to accomplish your mission. And so today, we celebrate that you are present with us, and in this meal, that you offer your grace, you offer life, you offer nourishment to us. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Let us remember that we were once separated by race, class, and age. We knew one another only as strangers and foreigners. But because of Jesus Christ, the dividing walls have been brought down. For through the cross, he's brought us peace, both with God and one another. The mystery of the gospel is that God was, has formed us into one family. We are now members of the same body and partakers of the same promise in Christ Jesus. Let us profess who God's called us to be as Christ Community Church. We are a community of people following Jesus and participating in God's restoration story. Let us remember the words that the Lord Jesus said on the night that he was betrayed. He took bread. This is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's life, death, and resurrection until he comes again. I ask if our lead worshipers would please come and receive the elements. Those of you worshiping with us online can receive the elements. And those of you here, would you please come and receive the grace?
Christ. As we come, we are offering ourselves to God to join God's mission. If you would like to offer your tithes and offerings online at this time, that would also be appropriate. Please come and receive the grace of Christ. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God. Perfect submission, all is at rest. High in my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking. Filled with his goodness and lost in his love. Oh, 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 oh. this is my story. Oh, what a Savior. 
is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day Let's pray. Lord, we are empowered by your presence. Even if we haven't partaken in you here in communion, the Eucharist, we are here present with others, rubbing shoulders with others who have taken you in themselves. Your love is infectious a thousandfold more so than COVID, and the thought of this fills me with peace and hope and I know you're spreading it to others, making me smile with excitement. But Lord, you are a gentleman, never encroaching where you haven't been invited. So to those who have invited Jesus into our lives, we ask for one thing. May we learn what your mission looks like in our lives. May we see the task that you have called us to at home, at work, at school, with our neighbors, our community, our country, and our world. You are making all things new. And we are thrilled to be beside you, watching you work beside us and through us. I can only imagine how many will be released from their addictions and shame and being stuck in so many ways because of you. I am excited to see your power emanated from us, emanating from us for the sake of freedom. I'm excited to see the darkness fleeing into the shadows and barring up the gates of hell, trying to block us from coming in and taking off the shackles of oppression and slavery that are on those people whom you love. I'm excited to see your promise fulfilled that the gates of hell, hell shall not even prevail against you and the church because you are with us and help us to do something about it. Open our eyes, help us to learn what your mission looks like in our lives, because little is much when you are with us. What is it that you have for us to do? This week, Lord, until we know what you have for us to do, send us out with that truth that we are enough for whatever you want to do through us. We ask this blessing upon ourselves and our friends, and all those that we are with, through the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We love that God works in us and through us, and we have celebrated Pastor Ron's ministry among us, just in our going and, and coming. You've retired now, but you haven't stopped the work. You're still enough. <laughs> You're still doing uh, go, good things and serving. But we do want to celebrate his retirement, uh, official retirement. So that's August 8th. Here in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a reception after this service. So I hope that uh, you'll plan on being here for that. And then a few weeks later, over Labor Day weekend, we are going to have the Labor Day weekend float trip. If you would like to participate in that, Please let Pastor Jen know. There will be sign-ups, hopefully, in uh, the e-newsletter this week. The website is still down, I think, so um, otherwise I'd say go there and sign up. But please, it's up and going, so you can get there. Friends, may you go in peace today. May you go to love God and to serve others. Amen.